Hi there, my name is Gordon Cheplak, and <laughs> I've been an interact designer for the past several years. I've had the opportunity to work with dozens of startups, agencies, and now my own projects. And while trying to become a better UX designer, I've also been trying to figure out what makes products successful. So I want to talk a bit today about user experience and behavioral bias. We all know what user experience is, but let's talk about bias. Bias is the inclination to present or hold a partial perspective at the expense of possibly equally valid alternatives. But what I mean when I say behavioral bias is really the intersection of many biases present in life, specifically cognitive bias and technological bias. In other words, how digital products affect our behaviors. And with regard to web products, I found that the behavioral bias lies somewhere between a number of factors, specifically user experience and technological bias, or technology. And I think that's important to note because um, a product can have great UX and tech and still have kind of a negative behavioral bias. And it's particularly interesting to look at these uh, social products that have emergent narratives. A social product with an emergent narrative is just a fancy way of saying, you know, somewhere where users tell the stories and those stories are in turn influenced by the nature of the product. Now, not just social products have emergent narratives. It seems like it's hard to find an actor these days who hasn't been in a movie about drugs or had some drug scandal or problem of their own. Drugs have strong behavioral bias. And I think they can be an apt metaphor for a lot of these social products. I think in this room, we're all happily addicted to Gmail. I know sometimes I can just go out and have a crazy night with my friends on Twitter. But seriously, thank God we all got off of MySpace years ago. This is all old media theory. Just as drugs enhance our senses, media extend our senses. And just as drugs can really help some people, I think these tools can help us accomplish great things. But a lot of drugs that were intended to help people ended up doing more harm than good. And I'm a bit concerned as to how we define good interactive social products because it seems like they're things that are less useful and more addictive in nature. That is to say, they have great user experience, but not necessarily a good behavioral bias. So there's this dichotomy between how these products are marketed and how they present themselves and what their effect on our behaviors actually is. And I'd like to take a look at some products I think have great UX and tech, but kind of some adverse behavioral biases. The ostensible goal of Facebook is to help us connect and share with the people in our lives. This sounds very noble, but it's not really what you end up doing on Facebook, is it? it seems like you end up browsing for hours, photographs of people you hardly know, or meticulously updating your profile to be the right blend of pop culture and obscure references. And you end up interacting with people in a weird way by seeing what somebody decided to like on a particular day or through some app you unknowingly let um, spam all of your friends. So I think, I think the movie The Social Network did a great job of showing some of the motivations behind the creation of this tool. You know, we, we all understand it's kind of weird and creepy, but we still use it. And I think that's because it has this implicit understanding of what makes good UX and how to exploit that and exploit our behavioral biases. Foursquare, another app with a nice value proposition. Check, it, check in, find your friends, discover new places. But you're not literally engaging with your friends and you're not unlocking new places. You are quite literally unlocking your phone a lot more. And because Foursquare has such strong user experience through some ingenious game mechanics, it's really easy to forget that. You know, um, people routinely will go out of their way to check in somewhere. Um, this is actually quite the opposite behavioral bias um, as exploring your city. So, well, I don't think there's going to be a feature film <laughs> on Foursquare anytime soon. I think the drug analogy from earlier holds up. You've got a couple of guys trying to monetize this really hot product without it blowing up in their faces. Of course, the big difference between Foursquare and crystal meth is that people actually pay for meth. <laughs> so we, <t> we recognize the technology, but what defines a product's longevity and success is, it, is it's how it affects their behaviors. And some products are doing that really well. Dropbox has become an integral part of many people's workflows, my own included. It's sharing functionality lets people collaborate without you know, clumsy things like email. A product of mine, views.fm, is actually built to enhance this. Um, Instagram, another great social product that um, actually came out of a product similar to Foursquare, but instead of focusing on location, they went with um, photo sharing and quick digital image processing. So people can spend less time um, worrying about managing their technology and more time taking pictures. So to all my like, UX designers, product people, strategists, I say this. Look beyond the user experience and technology and at how these products affect our lives so that we can build things that genuinely help people and we're not just pushing more addictive products. 
Thanks.